Hey guys, in this video, we'll be studying the factors that affect the rate of reaction using the collision theory. In order to understand the collision theory, we must first go through the kinetic theory of matter. The kinetic theory of matter states that matter is made up of tiny and discrete particles, very, very small particles that are separate from one another. And it also states that the particles are in constant random motion. All the tiny discrete particles are constantly moving. Solid particles will vibrate about their fixed position. Liquid and gas particles are free to move around. And they are moving randomly. Since the particles are always moving around randomly, there is bound to be collision of particles. And this is where the collision theory comes in. The collision theory states that reactant particles must collide with each other in order for a chemical reaction to occur. However, consider this, 78% of the air is made from nitrogen and 21% of the air is made from oxygen. So oxygen and nitrogen particles are bound to collide in the air. If each time they collide, a reaction ensues and nitrogen oxide is formed, then we would be depleted of oxygen in the air. There would be no more oxygen in the air and we would all suffocate. Obviously, that's not the case. So there's something more here. And this is where effective collision comes into play. Collision theory also states that the rate of reaction depends on the frequency of effective collision. So there are certain conditions in place. What is this effective collision? Effective collision is when the reaction particles collide. They must collide with energy that is equal to or more than activation energy. This concept of activation energy is like an energy barrier. The particles that are colliding, they must collide with enough energy in order for the reaction to take place. If they don't collide with enough energy, the reaction will not occur. And this minimum energy required for the reaction to take place is called the activation energy. Let's look at the activation energy in terms of graph. These two graphs that you see map the energy level of the reactants and the products as the reaction progresses. It's important to note that this is not a time axis. The x axis is not a time axis, but it only shows the reaction progress. So in the first graph, you can see the reactant particles have more energy than the product particles. And so the energy level drops. But that's not what we want to look at here. What we want to see is this in the middle, EA. EA stands for the activation energy. Visually, you can see that the reactant particles have to climb a hill. And once they reach the top of the hill, only then they can form the products. They can go down to form the products. So this is the energy barrier that the reactant particles have to overcome before they can become products. If the reactant particles don't have enough energy, they simply cannot overcome this barrier and become products. And this is how an endothermic reaction happens. The reactant energy is less than the product energy. But that's another topic. I'll leave a link to that in the description below. Check it out after this video. So once the reactant particles have enough energy to collide together, there is still another condition that needs to be met. And that is, they must collide in the correct orientation. They must collide in the proper positioning, proper arrangement. Let me give you an example of that. Let's say we have reactant A and B. This is a molecule, AB, that is going to react with C to form. These two are going to react together and they will form the products A, C, as well as B, C. Now consider this. Let's say this reactant AB collides with CC in this manner. Now if the collision takes place in this particular arrangement, it is not going to result in the product because only B and C are going to come into contact, whereas A and C are not in contact. So the best position for this reaction to occur would be if A was at the top, B was at the bottom, and C was like this. Now when the particles collide, both are in contact with one another. A is in contact with C and B is in contact with C. This is a much better position that would more likely result in product formation. So the arrangement of the particles are important as well. Let's look at four factors that affect the rate of reaction. That is, the concentration of the reactant, the size of particle of reactant, the temperature, as well as the presence of catalyst. Let's examine these factors using the collision theory. First, let's look at concentration. Here, I have two beakers. 
one has low concentration and the other has high concentration. So the visual here will tell you that in a solution where there is low concentration of solute, the number of solute particles in a given space, in a fixed space, so in a fixed volume, is less compared to a solution with high concentration. The proximity of the particles in a space is what matters. How close they are with each other in the same space. This is what will result in a higher rate of reaction. Let's explore this concept. Let's say we have a reactant and aqueous solution with high concentration. What you can clearly see is it is more crowded. More particles are nearer each other. And so these particles are going to randomly move. Remember this is kinetic theory of matter. They are going to constantly be moving randomly. And so when we compare the collision between a low concentration aqueous solution and a high concentration aqueous solution, it is clear that there will be more collisions with the high concentration simply because the number of particles per unit volume increases. And this is a very important point. It's not that the number of particles themselves increase, but the number of particles confined in the same volume increases. And because of that, this is going to result in an increase in the frequency of collision. They're going to collide more often. Now, again, not all collisions will result in the product formation. However, an increased frequency of collision will also increase the chances of effective collisions occurring. And therefore, the frequency of effective collision also increases. Once the frequency of effective collision increases, according to collision theory, the rate of reaction depends on the frequency of effective collision. And therefore, the rate of reaction increases as well. So a higher concentration means higher rate of reaction. Now let's look at size of particle. When we compare size of particles, there are two things that we need to remember. First of all, these have to be solid reactant particles. Second of all, we are comparing the same mass of particles. And so let's look at the effect of size of particles. Remember, the collision theory states that the rate of reaction is directly proportional to the rate of effective collision. And so once again, collision is involved. And if we have a particle that is large, the particles that we are referring to here is not whether it's an atom, ion or molecule. Those are not the particles that we are talking about. We are talking about the chunks of particle, whether it's a small chunk or a large chunk. This is what we mean by particle size here. And so, if we have a large chunk of particle, the reaction can only occur with the particles on the surface because the particles on the surface are the particles that are exposed for collision. So collision can only occur with other reactant particles on the surface. Now let's calculate the surface area for this large cube here on the left. One face is 4 centimeters. A cube has 6 faces and therefore the total surface area in this cube will be 24 centimeter square. That is the area that is exposed for collision. Now let's say this same particle, we take and we cut it twice into this. It is the same particle, the same mass. Now the only thing that we are doing is we are cutting it into smaller pieces. So we are decreasing the particle size. What happens when we decrease the particle size? Here, let's calculate the surface area again. This face will be 1 cm square and this will be 2 cm square. So this will result in the total surface area would be 1 times 8. There are 8 faces that have 1 cm square and then we have 2 times 16 phases. And this will give us a value of 40 cm square. Now, the spaces that were initially closed on the inside, these areas that were closed on the inside before cutting into them, they are now exposed. And so reactant particles can collide with these surfaces inside as well. And so essentially, by increasing the surface area, we have increased the frequency of collision. So by decreasing the particle size, we have increased the surface area, the total surface area exposed for collision. And therefore, the frequency of collision will increase. When the frequency of collision increases, the frequency of effective collision also increases. And therefore, the rate of reaction will increase. And so a decrease in the size of the particle will result in an increased rate of reaction. Let's go to temperature. 
For temperature, it is important to understand that the average kinetic energy of the particles are directly proportional to the temperature. As the temperature increases, the kinetic energy of the particles will increase as well. And it's also important to remember that for a sample of particles, not all particles will possess the same energy. Some of the particles will have very low energy. Some particles will have very high energy. However, most of the particles will have an energy level somewhere in between the two. And so, this is the distribution of particles. It's a normal distribution. Most of the particles will have energy somewhere in the middle. Some will have very high energy, some will have very low energy. They will not all have equal energy. And so, let's say the activation energy is here. This is the activation energy. According to the collision theory, the particles must collide with or more than the activation energy, which would mean that only this portion of the particles will result in effective collision. Only this portion of the particles will be able to form the product. Now, what happens when we increase the temperature? When you increase the temperature, what we are doing is we are increasing the average kinetic energy of the particles. So the particles that originally had this amount of energy, let's call this E1, will now have increased energy. They will increase energy to E2. And so these particles will now be here. And this is the same for the whole graph. The whole graph is going to shift to the right. So what we have done is we've increased the average kinetic energy of all the particles. So now all the particles are going to shift to the right. And now you can see that we have more particles, a larger proportion of particles are going to have the activation energy or higher. And therefore, now when they collide, it is going to result in an effective collision and products will form. This is how the temperature affects the rate of reaction. So the number of particles with energy to overcome activation energy will increase when we increase the temperature. Also remember we are increasing the kinetic energy, therefore the frequency of collision will increase because now they are going to be moving around faster with greater kinetic energy. And when the frequency of collision increase and the number of particles with energy to overcome activation energy increases, these two factors combined, this is going to increase the frequency of effective collision. And since the frequency of effective collision is increased, we also have an increase in the rate of reaction. Let's move on to the effect of the presence of a catalyst on the rate of reaction. Let's say there's a catalyst in this reaction that is specific to this reaction. What the catalyst does is, the catalyst actually provides an alternative pathway with a lower activation energy. What that looks like on our energy level diagram, these reactants are going to have to climb a smaller hill in order to reach the products. So the activation energy will drop. Let's call this E A prime. With the lower activation energy, what happens is more particles will have energy that is equal to or more than activation energy. I'll illustrate that in a while. Let me just show you the other graph as well. So this is the same. The activation energy is going to drop whether it's endothermic or exothermic reaction. This energy level drops. So this is the new activation energy that is lower than the blue activation energy, the original activation energy. Let's take a look at the graph of the number of particles against the energy again. So once again, the energy of each particle is different in a sample of reactants. Not all reactants will have the same amount of energy. And so only a certain proportion of the total number of particles will be able to form the product. What the catalyst does is, it does not change the energy level of the reactant particles. Instead, it brings down the activation energy. It lowers the standard for the reaction to take place. So what we are essentially doing is, we are moving this activation energy backwards to a lower level. Let's call this Ea prime. And so now, without doing anything to the energy level of the particles itself, we have increased the number of particles that have the energy level that is equals to or more than the activation energy. If this is a bit difficult to understand, let's imagine that 
There's 10 students in a class and they are graded for a test and these are their marks. So the marks represent the energy level of the particles. And so you can see each student has a different number of marks which represents different energy levels in each particle. And let's say the passing mark, the activation energy, the passing mark is 90%. 90% passing mark. So from here we can tell that only two students have passed. This means only two particles have energy greater than activation energy. Only two particles can form products. Now what we do when we add a catalyst is, the teacher comes in and says, now we slash the passing mark from 90 to 80. So you can see, all that's being done here is, we are lowering the activation energy, we are lowering the passing mark. The amount of energy by the particles is not changed. The marks by the students themselves is not changed at all. But in lowering the passing mark, in lowering the activation energy, what has now happened is, we have a lot more students passing. Six students have passed instead of two students. And this is the concept of lowering activation energy. And the catalyst does this by providing an alternative pathway for the reaction to occur. That's it for this video guys. If you've learned something, please do me a favor and hit that like button. It really does help the channel a lot. Thank you very much for doing that. If you enjoy videos like this, do subscribe because I'll be producing at least one a week. I'll see you guys in the next video.